Welcome to the Angewandte Festival 2020 and to the FWF project Co-Corporeality, Reality Interactive Spaces in the Era of Biomediality. My name is Barbara Imhoff and together with uh, Daniela Unterberger and Tiziano Derme, I co-lead the project Co-Corporeality, Reality, which uh, is about uh, establishing a new performative architecture allowing a non-verbal communication between humans and microbial and social or living matter with the help of machine learning. And um, part of the artistic research project, of course, is to develop new prototypes, interactive installations and uh, architectural interventions. But the other part is to create a platform for exchange and discourse and uh, theoretical thoughts. And therefore, I'm very happy that we can welcome Jens Hauser. Hi, Jens. Hi. <laughs> who will give a keynote on biomediality and microperformativity, art agency, and animation in times of wetware. Jens will talk about 20 minutes. And so afterwards, we have some time for questions. And uh, please feel free either to you know, appear on screen and ask the questions directly or uh, write them in the chat. Um, Daniela and Tiziano will observe uh, that uh, and um, tell, uh, tell us then what the questions are. Short introduction to Jens Hauser, that's very difficult because he has been pursuing a bio art and everything related to it uh, since um, more than 20 years, I would say. He's a Copenhagen and Paris-based media studies scholar and art curator focusing on the interactions between art and technology, trans genre and hybrid aesthetics. And he sort of works in the, at the intersection of media studies, art history and epistemology. And he has previously developed an aesthetic and epistemological theory of biomediality, a term he also coined as part of his PhD uh, at the University in Copenhagen. But he also holds a degree in science and technology journalism from the uh, Universit Université uh, François Rabelais in Tours. Um, he is quite well known for many uh, exhibitions he curated uh, in uh, all about uh, biotechnology, um, uh, in topics like transbiotics, synthetic ethic, and um, well, matters, but also, for example, applied microperformativity, which he uh, curated together with Lucy Strecker in Vienna in 2018. Uh, but he has done numerous of works, and so um, we are extremely honored to have you here, Jens. Please, um, Thanks the a lot, floor Bar is yours. Thanks a lot, Barbara. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Daniela and Tiziano as well. So, I do not want to lose much time, so I'm just diving directly into the key currents. I will disappear behind my presentations in some seconds. So in this short presentation, I want to address this potential of two operational concepts I've fruitfully been working with for the last years, both as a media and art theoretician and as a curator, biomediality and microperformativity, the latter of which is also the title of a forthcoming special issue for the journal Performance Research I'm currently co-editing with Lucy Strecker. And I'm using both terms here as a conceptualizing tool progressively since 2003, and they both have been probably chosen also by yourself because they can make sense within your research project co-corporality at the Angewandte and also in relation to the challenging panel later this evening, Alien Life Between Brains, Bacteria and Matter. So I will just share my screen now. <laughs> Can you see it? Yes. Yes, we can. Very much. So, co-corporality presupposes at least two types of bodies which establish a uni or bidirectional affective connection. So, in times when artists are using living organisms or systems, this requires to think of performance and performativity in terms of other than human agency, both biological and technical. And it also requires to redefine what a body is today. In Latin, 
a body is a corpus, an organized physical substance, but the term doesn't imply at all any scale or nature, and it's not anthropomorphic as such by definition. So in times when performance art, which until recently mainly involved human bodies, shifts towards a more general pattern of performativity in art, artists and performers also redefine what actually is considered a body. And they may displace their focus from its mesoscopic actions to its microscopic functions, from physical gestures to physiological processes, and from staged narrative time to real performative time, even of an experimental setting in a petri dish. So we are currently witnessing an attempt to escape the scales represented in this famous Leonardo drawing of the Vitruvian man, in which the human body and its ideal proportion establish analogies for the logics of architecture and other disciplines, the universe at large. What today appears at anthropocentrism has come under critical and humorous scrutiny, subverting the material man in the light of other metrics and logics that are, for example, molecular or microbial. So such subversions uh, question the human scale as crucial reference point as such. The image I've chosen for the announcement of this talk shows artwork by Mexican artist Gilberto Esparza, recently shown at our exhibition Ouvert, Phytophilia, Chlorophobia, Situated Knowledges in Bourges, France. His works pertain to microperformativity and biomediality alike. So first, the bodies, both of which plantas nomadas and his plantas autophotosyntheticas, are conceived as decentralized ecosystems containing bacteria in microbial fuel cells, cells to produce energy for robotic actions. The plantas autophotosyntheticas use energy extracted by DIY microbial fuel cells from wastewater to produce the light that the aquatic plants and cyanobacteria in the installation require to conduct photosynthesis. So the not so individual creature seems to have organs, but distributed ones. And the plantas nomadas also combine hardware, software, and wetware to purify polluted water, filter out chemicals, release oxygen, and generate energy, becoming increasingly self-sufficient as they learn to navigate. And if they are said to express autonomous or intelligent behavior, this might not result in the mimicking of human cognition, but rather the system's decentralized intelligence to clean up human's mess in times of major ecological crisis. So historically, the creation of lifelike appearances have become, has been an ever recurring historical feature in art. So since the first uh, anthropomorphic status, myths of vivification, uh, artifacts by the artist hand, the art, the animation of matter stands in a long picture tradition. So by means of form, material and process, a touch of aliveness is staged. So art has imagined, representative, mimicked, and then simulated and more recently manipulated living beings and systems for real, since genetics, tissue engineering, DNA chips, or so-called biobricks have entered experimental arts repertoire. So mainly we have three ways to convey aliveness, representation and concept-based traditional contemporary art, then presence, process, and phenomen-based dry media art with robotics or informatics, for example, and then likewise presence, process, and phenomen-based wet media art that employs biomediality. The latter uh, two of which are relevant with regards to how the media arts selectively stage life. In the light of cybernetics, artists have been inspired by the simulation of emergent and intelligent behaviors such as Gray Walters' early turtles, mobile uh, robotic vehicles equipped with sensors able to explore the environment. And the whole genre of media art installations has emerged in this field, such as Ken Rinaldo's interactive sculptures, Autopoesis, or even the self-repairing robotic chair by De Andrea and Dean that, while indeed not resembling anything organic, express aliveness through movement, behavior, and learning. A very different approach to aliveness is addressed in Tour van Balen's synthetic biology-based project Pigeon d'Or, attempting at making pigeons defecate soap by modifying the metabolism of bacteria occurring in their gut with the help of biobricks. Or think of Wim Delvoye's digestion machines, branded cloacas, where functional organic processes between enzymes and gut bacteria are enacted to produce excrement. 
It's without any doubt a performative installation and even visitors often applaud as its droppings fall. In this slide, we need to scrutinize which characteristics of aliveness artists selectively put their emphasis on since their choices serve as indicators of the philosophical and techno-scientific context within which they operate. So a very complete definition of life is being manifested by a sum of characteristics, including some of which one can also find in the inanimate world is proposed, and uh, you can read it on the slide by Bernard Rentsch in his epistemology-based biophilosophy from the 60s. And I will just re read through this text because, and then emphasize what the uh, key points are. So living beings are hierarchically organized, open systems of predominantly organic compounds. They usually constitute clearly delineated cellular individuals showing a temporary constancy. The cells are morphologically characterized by specifically functioning organelles. With regards to their chemical constitution, they are characterized by specific proteins and nucleic acids. Metabolism and exchange of energy give rise to activity and maintain the organism in a state of dynamic equilibrium. Determined by complex structural and functional interrelationships, and controlled by particular steering and feedback systems. They show specific reactions to external stimuli. All the structures. Excuse me? Okay. All their structures and processes are mainly purposive, serving a rational functioning of the organs and the maintenance of the individual and the species but historically conditioned by the structure of the organism's phylogenetic ancestors. So reproduction through totipotent cells is linked with changes of form in the course of the individual's life, but organisms undergo phylogenetic alteration through mutation of the hereditary factors. There are links in the continuous chain of cells that constitute the stream of life to which probably every species of organism ultimately belongs. And then the progressive development in many lines of descent made the emergence of complicated psychological processes possible only at the end. So which characteristics of the living are being emphasized by artists? When, how, and why? So for example, practitioners of dry robotic media art may emphasize activity, regulation, and irritability. Those with an interest in digital simulation of populations may be on reproduction, evolution, and mutation. And practitioners of wet biotechnological art may be on metabolism, dynamic stability, and the protein-based materiality of the displays. So these preferences reflect in turn onto the chosen art media with which the agents of aliveness are being coupled. And a very good example of how this criteria can be combined is the so-called posthuman sound piece self by Australian artist Guy Benari, featuring a rock star in a petri dish, playing together with a human jazz musician. Here, a cluster of lab-cultured spiking neurons, biological ones, derived from the cell line of a rat, uh, is generating sounds connected to electronic machinery, a kind of neural synthesizer. But having the question in mind of how co-corporeality is generated, this piece is of a particular interest because it combines the performance with an emphasis of presenting something to an audience and the performativity, highlighting the execution of whichever action of the spiking nerve cells here in the techno-scientific apparatus, while the main purpose of the non-human performativity is not the encounter with an audience. For this reason, the piece is also analyzed in our forthcoming issue on microperformativity in performance research by Chris Salter. Chris Salter, who is also the author of Entangled Technology and the Transformation of Performance and Alien Agency. Salter argues that performativity itself needs to be understood as a technical cultural hybrid. Tracing it back to the early 20th century, his book Entangled demonstrates that performative forms and the fascination of the machinic had gone hand in hand forever, but that, quote, the long history of technological entanglement with performance practice has been ignored and downplayed not only in theater and dance histories or post-dramaturgy, but also in the recent search of writing about the new media. 
A long result that we can argue that the career of the term to perform is not only an etymological, but also an epistemological one. If we witness a shift from performance art, from performance as object of inquiry, to performativity as a method of inquiry, four main developments have become entangled. First, in linguistics and speech act theory, John Austin popularized the ideas that the performative expression or utterance does not just describe an action in language, but actually performs or activates something. Non-descriptive language does not just represent statements, but is an inherently material practice in the way it can change the course of an event. In the upcoming gender studies, the performative program is pursued by cultural theorists such as Judith Butler to study the human body's gendering as not ontologically pre-given, but instead performatively produced in and over time. Then, in parallel, the performative turn in anthropology and sociology under the influence of anthropologist Victor Turner and theater director Richard Cheshner further transformed the previous concept of performance as a subject of research into the performative as a technique of self-reflection, as a method by which research would be conducted, allowing to focus on the nonverbal, the embodied, and the imminent act of doing. And last, in science and technology studies, the performative program is extended to the analysis of knowledge production in laboratories. It takes into account the role of technocultural hybrids, experimental systems, and the agency of non-humans thus displacing humans as the sole producers of knowledge or expressors of agency. So while performativity is no longer confiscated in the human-centric tradition, but just denoting the capacity of an agent to act in the world, it is here that the concepts of micro-performativity and biomediality overlap. And for our issue on performance research, Chris Zelda has designed a map that structures the epistemes of performance into a coordinate systems of references between performative artistic actions, cultural techniques, contingent construction of meaning, and of course, the performativity in science. And interestingly, it is in this last that Salta situates the notion of the micro performance, uh, linked to material agency, performative experiments, and the intervention of agency at large. So now let's see in the second and last part, how this relates to the concept of biomediality and to misunderstanding that the allegedly evident term media produces. Just imagine that we ask some cell biologist to bring please their medium. They will probably not turn up in company with a visionary shaman, neither with a television or a tablet computer, but maybe with a thermocycler, a kind of molecular photocopy mm -hmm. machine, and even more likely, with a flask of gross media for cell culture. So the meaning of the concept of mediality itself mutates and needs to be seen historically in its etymological and epistemological evolution. As historian Eric Porat reminds us, in the past, the word medium was used more frequently in the context of the nature than of the human science as an intermediary element, as a milieu, and only later as a means or tool. For this reason, today's mere focus on functions of communication causes us, quote, to lose sight of the natural scientific relevance of mediality so that cultural studies and traditional media studies generally lack consideration of the natural science and the history. Accordingly, to analyze strategies of web media art, I've set up a grid of three types of biomediality. First, life enabling milieus, so biological media, to be understood as existential conditions that enable a body and its internal functions. And technical, this comprises, for example, uh, in art as well, experimental systems where milieus are simulated, for example, in tissue culture with incubators and growth media. Second, technical means, biomedia as transformative generative means, whereby Biological systems do something, but beyond their own organic purpose. They are processing bodies, their molecules, organisms, populations, cells, as synthesis factories, viral promoters, programmed bacteria, etc. And third, they are the instances of measurement, media of biology employed to measure, analyze, and observe. So dispositives in which 
one organic system reveals something about another to produce knowledge. So they are historically positioned in the tradition of microscopy or cell cinematography, such as today we have biomarkers, biosensors, DNA chips, or gel electrophoresis at, um, subverted or appropriated by artists. But now a kind of paradox appears, and which is important with regards to biomediality's conceptual link to agency, performativity, and co corporality. The usual claim that media need to be stable, dead, neutral, or soft transmitters of hard content, supposed to be indifferent vis a vis what they control, transmit, store, or process, here fails. In the case of biomediality, media not only actually produce what they pretend to merely mediate, they have own agency. So have a closer look on three examples. Biological media in the sense of milieu. In this piece, very known by the victimless leather the, or the tissue culture and art project, the liquid gross medium contains fetal calf serum, and this acts as a gross stimulator. And while the product ordered online just seems to be a standardized substrate, it didn't consist of a very much overlooked cocktail of multiple microperformative agencies. But since often researchers ignore the exact composition of such media, it appears to be passive. But in fact, it contains signaling molecules that activate cell growth and trigger intracellular changes. Second example could be biomedia as transformative generative means implies to modify organisms so to accomplish technically programmed functions. The example here is that of Joe Davis' bacterial radio, shown for the first time at the Vienna Natural History Museum in the synthetic exhibition mentioned earlier. And this bacterial radio uses variants of a gene from an orange marine puffball sponge in transgenic bacteria that are employed to plate uh, electronic circuits and thus to grow a crystal radio circuit. However, the bacteria may get contaminated or die and so may also die the not so stable radio. And then media of biology employed to measure can be seen in Paul Vanus's performative gel electrophoresis installations, which subvert so-called genetic fingerprinting to create figurative motifs instead of the usual abstract banding patterns. So the artist employs enzymes to cut genetic sequences, primers, molecular probes to produce these DNA images. But However, the calculated motifs are not clean digital images. They only approximate, they are full of smear, since the manifold biological agents involved depend on a very large power, range of parameters that conditions their life and work. So artists, as we have seen, purposefully link instances of biomediality also with pre-existing media, be it script, sculpture, photography, telecommunication, etc., resulting in hypermedial interweavings. But the concept of biomediality here crosses a number of exhibitions, projects, and festivals I've been involved in during the last years. And here biomediality defines the ensemble of all enabling factors that arise as a result of the organization of living organisms or biological processes, be they technically manipulated or just appropriated to made usable from the microscopic to the macroscopic. So at first sight, biomediality can be understood as a special form of loose coupling of de- and reorganized biological entities. Following Fritz Heider's physics-inspired early media theory from the 1920s. But such an atomistic principle differentiates itself, however, from that of media understood merely physically in that organisms, as a central point of reference, are or were in first instance organized. So we might define such biological loose coupling as organized atomism, and it's microperformative in this very double sense. First, humans can technically use de- and reorganize biological entities, and second, the latter do not cease to play off their own inherent agencies as such. And this is where we come to the last point. It is in the spirit that guides also our publication on microperformativity, opening up this concept to a very large variety of interpretations in 27 international contributions. So the chapters inquire how artistic methods can actually engage with technologies that exploit life on a macroscopic and molecular level to merge bio and digital media, including for global capitalization. 
how can performative art and discourses inform these processes to think biopolitics and necropolitics in relation to the dystopia of economy and the utopia of ecology alike. So the topics that we have cover microbial transplantation as self-experiment, microgestures, bacterial labor, protocells and non-terrestrial agency in space, ecological performance, or bird flu related traditional Indian performance. But while performativity often appears just to be a proxy of aliveness, agency, we argue, is also technical. And therefore, we also publish papers on microperformative and techniques of craft, such as weaving, through the lens of the natural science, as well as in economics in times of algorithmic finance and high frequency trading. So I hope that some of these notions uh, and concepts I tried to describe and they turn out to be fruitful for the artistic panel at eight o'clock. And I thank you very much for your kind attention. And thank you very much, uh, Jens, for this uh, very informative, dense and concise uh, presentation on biomediality and microperformativity. Uh, do we have any questions? Well, um, maybe I, I, I'd like to um, just start maybe. I think we have time for, for one or two questions. Um, there is, uh, you're writing in one of your texts that this whole era, I would say, of bio art started in the 1990s. And, um, and this whole, I would say, field of ex artistic exploration is very much linked to, um, to, to societal um, developments and maybe economic developments. Um, where would you, you know, what was the reason why suddenly this whole uh, area of uh, artistic research emerged in the 1990s? What do you think? What was the context? I think there was a, a, a general shift in science. There was the Human Genome Project going on, and which was very timely since it appropriated cultural, um, very dominant metaphors such as the code. And if you look back also to the Ars Electronica Festival in 1993 already, which was mainly on dry media art and simulation and uh, agency that is coming out of a transposition of the biological metaphors into the digital realm, we had a reverse phenomenon. So I think that why it came up so strongly in the media arts is that there was a strong quest for rematerialization and it is at the same point also to reverse the materiality uh, of the adequate media back to the origin metaphors. And then there was also, of course, the whole political um, G GMO debates. What about genetically modified crops? What about uh, tissue culture as organ substitutes and so on? So I think it was both a cultural, economic and, of course, a technical scientific phenomenon. Thank you. I think we have one question. DM Barry, uh, could you please make yourself visible and Sorry. ask the question? I hope I'm visible and audible. Thank you, Jens. Wonderful, wonderful talk. I, I was wondering in, in your, your three parts at the end about biomediality, uh, in, in the example of the radio, which, which was um, kind of media as the message, if I got it right, and then I thought it was my media as tool. And for me, the, the radio seemed like media, so, so the biology as, as a tool. So I was, was wondering uh, if that divide is so clear, if, uh, if the biology, the biological aspects are really being used as a message or if they're really being used more as a tool. Um, this piece by Joe Davis is, is very interested, I think, in many senses. First, because it's a kind of retro futurist piece to say that you're not going to construct something very complicated, but actually the most primitive device using extremely high end uh, genetic technologies to actually come up with a kind of retro feature. So it's ironic in the sense, and it very much uh, points to the irony that often the hacker movement and the DIY movements have had. So and then I think there is actually the desire to technically create a radio, uh, which is a new mediality. And I was driving together with Joe Davis through Cambridge at some point, and I said, Joe, you know, why don't you make your art a little bit more visual? How how can you uh, make this art even reach people without they have to comprehend all this kind of explanatory uh, 
uh, bagage behind that and said, look, look, media changes are quicker than uh, you might imagine. In, uh, in 10 years, everybody will going to have as media at home, a kind of sequencer. And look, we have been uh, driving through Cambridge with this very antique car, with this even more antique car radio. And he said, you know, this digital station, uh, this station, my radio station, my preferred radio station, I cannot really listen to anymore because it's getting digital. But in 10 years, everybody will have a sequencer at home. Thank you. Uh, there's, uh, we have a little bit more time uh, from uh, the, the Angewandte the, the Directing Master of Ceremony. So if there's, there are more questions, we can ask them. We cannot hear you very well, Daniela. Cannot hear me. Now we can hear you very well. Now you can hear me very yeah. well. Great to be Please. Said, uh, thank you. I can hear you. Uh, thank you very much for the for the really amazing talk, uh, Jens. And we were wondering, and you also know why we also keep on wondering about that. Um, what happens to time uh, within the process of staging aliveness as a method to inquire new performative protocols? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, what happens, what, what does real time mean or right. delayed time in this, uh, in this process? Mm -hmm. It comes back to a question that is very often overlooked because when we think of scaling, very often we start from scaling at uh, the spatial scaling, micro, macro, but we less think about the temporal scaling. While for me, this art often has also been very connected to recreating a presence, to be in co-corporality in a live presence. And uh, I have been resonating very much with what Hans Ulrich Gumbrecht have been written about production of presence, what meaning cannot convey, that we need a kind of presence culture. But what is interesting is that Gumbrecht in this book also outlines the origins of the presence as we understand it as preesse. And the preesse in the Latin sense is in the first instance to be in front of the preesse, being in front of, and only the second one, the temporary one that is guiding modern contemporary culture. So I think that the, there is something about temporality here, also in how far you, you can feel a presence that is physical and how far this is altered and emphasized even further when you know that it's in real time. And then I think there's also the question, which is very relevant to your work, also about the compression of temporal scales and how far also different organisms have not only different lifespans, but also different wavelengths and different modalities to react to a different stimulus. So I think the question of not only looking at scale in terms of space, but in terms of temporality is extremely important. Thank you. Um, are there any other uh, questions uh, from the audience? No, I have one, uh, one last one maybe. Uh, you showed a slide where, uh, where you read a, a text and then it, you sort of created a matrix and it looked as if it would be a cookbook for uh, different kinds of um, mm -hmm. Uh, you know, ways of doing um, bio art in, or, <laughs> or, 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 you know, staging aliveness or, or whatever. Is it, uh, do, do you really think that there's something like that? Or what was the, your motivation to do this? You mean the definition of life by, by range and the, the, the criteria that one can extract from that? Yeah, you said like, okay, if I take these three, then I'm in robotics. If I take these other, you know, mm -hmm. it sounded like, you know, if it's a sort of, um, you know, cookbook with recipes, you know, if I take these three <laughs> <laughs> topics and... Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, the comparison is very good and I like it. And I thank you for that. I never thought of it as a cookbook. But what is interesting is that for a cookbook, if you want to make an intelligent, even a complete meal, you may have some uh, carbohydrates, you have some veggies and you have some fat and you have this and that, but you don't need everything, right? So what is interesting in the way I think that uh, artists pick from this recipe is in order to evoke the very appearance of something to be alike, it's sufficient to just pick two or three, right? 
and then you can forget about the other. But still, even if life is such a complex phenomenon, you can just simulate it by so different criteria so that we can even associate with a chair that is really self-assembling that it's alive. Right? So it's a weakness of the, very, uh, the, the, the concept of liveness, but it also points to a much more important feature, which is what I call media adequacy. How, as an artist, you choose the media that are adequate in relation to your message. And is it uh, uh, the right thing to choose digital media to talk about growth or whatever, you know? And in order to create this reflection and self-criticism about what media adequacy might be in the media arts, I think that this kind of um, detection and uh, uh, and uh, and uh, diffraction of, of this cookbook style recipe is very useful to look at your own practice. Thank you. Yeah, yeah thanks. Um, yeah, if there are not uh, any other questions, is there any other question? Can't see anything in the chat. Then um, I would like uh, to thank you, Jens. It was a wonderful uh, lecture. And I'd also like to um, invite everybody to join our next um, little bit longer symposium starting at 8 o'clock, uh, either through the uh, Angewandte Festival live stream, or you can also find a Zoom link on the uh, cocoreality.net website. And we will, it's a similar. Uh, Topic, I would say it's called alien life between brains, bacteria and matter. And we have invited uh, designers, uh, scientists, artists from all over the world, uh, including Jens as the curator um, to uh, expand a little bit more on the issue and look uh, at different kinds of projects um, which were created uh, by these people. So, well, stay tuned, I would say, but you have to switch the channel and um, I see you soon. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.